All right. All right. Looks like we are live today, Steve. Um, looks like we are still getting everything a little connected. So I'm just going to, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Live is better than the alternative. <laughs> yes, that is a very, very much better for it. And it looks like we've got some people starting to join now. It's made its way all the way through to that Facebook filter today. Um, so I am just so excited to have you here today. I know the, the topic that we're going to be talking about is a little bit of a tough one. Um, I know it's going to be, be tough for you and it's it's really important and we, we really thank you to share, share your story. But to introduce us and introduce who we are, uh, my name is Chris Menges. I am the Chief Veterinary Officer here at Face Paws and we are here to talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, which is a silent killer and the piano playing cat named Ricky. Now with me is Steve Dale. Um, famous, famous uh, veterinary journalist. Um, he has his own radio show from Steve Dale's Pet World and is personally connected to Ricky. Um, that's that's the really kind of the reason that we we wanted to have you on and have you tell your story today. So how are you doing with all of today and, and the story? Are you, are you prepared to tell it? Of course I'm prepared to tell it. Uh, I'm doing okay today. It's a tough time in America now. So Mm -hmm. I, I just want to wish everyone well and and wish you all good health, both physical health and psychological health. Um, and But I do have exciting news for you, Dr. Menges, before we start. Of course. I'd love to hear exciting news. Are you ready? I mean, hold on. Let me, let me, let me prep. Get ready. Yeah, let's see it. All right. Cat lovers everywhere. The book Decoding Your Cat is now available for pre-sale. I was honored to write the foreword for that book, but uh, this book describes cat behavior. It decodes cat. If it's possible for anyone to decode cats, not easy to do, right? They're cats. <laughs> Members of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists have combined their efforts for the second time ever. The first time was a book called Decoding Your Dog. And I'll tell you a little secret. I told, you won't tell anyone, shh. I told the publisher I wanted to do a book called Decoding Your Cat first. And the publisher and I had a fight and, and he said, cat books don't sell. And I said, yeah, they do. <laughs> and we went back and forth. We ended up, I lost. They ended up do, doing Decoding Your Dog first. It was a great book. It is still selling like crazy. Mm. This book, if you, if you have any questions at all about cat behavior, they're answered by uh, what I believe are the ultimate experts. I'm a, a certified animal behavior consultant myself. These are veterinary behaviors. And, and oftentimes, as you know, Dr. Menges, a, a problem in, in an individual dog or cat, uh, we assume is solely behavior. Often there's something medical that may be involved in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact that these are the folks who did the research in the first place, for me to talk about what I talk about in the second place, it is uh, an amazing, amazing book, even for those who are so experienced on the cat side. If you've had cats, if you're a fancier breeder, uh, your entire life, you will learn, I did in reading this book again called Decoding Your Cat, available right now for pre-sale on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. I also wanna say, uh, as I give this talk, uh, I want to hear from you. I know Dr. Menges does too. So your comments are uh, welcome and encouraged. Some we may answer throughout the course of our conversation, our talk. Others uh, will answer at the end of it where we've left time for answers. At the bottom of the screen, you see text cats to donate. That is to donate for the win. No, it's not there. It's here. No, it's not. It's <laughs> for the sure you laugh this is the guy who does television all the time and i can't it out. the wimpy line foundation uh the only organization like it uh, on the planet literally that exists solely to fund studies for cat health i've set up a fund a long time ago called the ricky fund which i'll talk about through the course of this and a lot of what dr menges will talk about a lot of what we know about feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM, uh, we know because of research that we have funded at the Wind Feline Foundation and funded through money I've helped to raise and others have too, uh, called the Ricky Fund. Uh, so when we're set to start, sir, we are 
set to start. It's we are set time. to start. We are set to start. And, you know, I just want to say, uh, again, we are so excited to be able to uh, help contribute to the to the rookie fund as base pause. So for for the since May 20th until the end of May, all of the kits that we sold, including the ones over a Memorial Day and anything like that, five dollars from each kit is going to the Ricky Fund. Um, this is such uh, an important need. It affects so many cats, like we'll talk about a little later, um, that will constantly bring up the, the need to focus on this, to help people learn about it, and help learn how to prevent this itself. Um, so with without further ado, I think I think we start to roll a little bit into this. And um, this, of course, is our little splash screen. Um, and it is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a silent killer, and a piano playing cat named Ricky. And Steve, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you start. I'm gonna let you start and give your give your story. You bet. So, uh, be before I talk about Ricky, uh, those kits, Dr. Menjus, you'll talk about. You'll explain what they are and how people can get those kits. Mm -hmm. That is, in fact, uh, Ricky. Uh, Ricky spends so much of his time, as you see, on my shoulder, and I'll talk about all that. As you see, this was many years ago. So this image was probably taken 22 or 24 years ago, something like that. Uh, Ricky was a young cat at that time, sadly. He never lived to be an old cat, which I'll talk about. Um, yeah, and you know, that is, you know, you mentioned that that's such a sudden change. That sudden change is, is really tough on there as well. So this is Lucy. We had a Ricky and a Lucy. Think about it. <laughs> I'm not sure. You might have to clue in some of the uh, younger audience on exactly where Ricky and Lucy's coming from. Well, then they don't watch Hulu. So <laughs> um, the dog that is, well, they're both dogs there, but the one that's a miniature Australian Shepherd, uh, the smaller of the two dogs, knew all of these little tricks. Uh, she did animal-assisted activities at a variety of places, including what was then called the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, very famous place. Uh, my wife, Robin, would go down and uh, usually work with kids because that was kind of her specialty with our little dog. Kids loved the dog because, in fact, uh, the kids would say, this was the, so at the right, is that your right? If you're watching this, I don't know. We're <laughs> going, ooh, right there. What, what I did was I trained her. Don't even, I don't even know how I did this, really. I trained her to say, I would say, <coughs> excuse me, I would say, that's that's not it. I would say um, to the little kids, do you speak, <coughs> oh my gosh, do you speak Ethiopian? And the little kids would shake their head, no. Do you speak Japanese? And they'd say, shake her head, no. I said, my dog does. And I would just have to look at Lucy. And she would do that. She would go, oh, and kids were so entertained by that. She literally could jump through hoops. She knew all of these tricks. And my wife, Robin, came home one day and said, teach her another one. And I thought, what? <laughs> tricks, you know? So I don't know what made me think of this. I went to Toys R Us. I don't even think they're still around. And bought a little kid's piano. Mm -hmm. And that's the little kid's piano. Uh, I closed the door to the room. I don't know if you guys know, you guys know clicker training. It, it's a way to condition dogs or cats or other animals. So a lot of the animals you see on TV commercials are in fact clicker trained. Dolphins are in a sense clicker trained, except they use a whistle. Uh, and what happens is you pair the clicker. It's a little box that goes click, click. You could use a pen even. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a novel sound to the animal, so, and it's a consistent sound that always sounds the same. You pair that with a treat, uh, and soon enough, that animal understands, oh my gosh, it's a great thing. I get a treat when I hear that sound. And then uh, the dogs, it's called shaping a behavior. So Lucy, the dog, her paw went up a little toward one of those piano keys. I'd click the clicker. A little more, I'd click the clicker. I'd close the door to the room, and I was working with the dog. And we were about 10 minutes in. I mean, Lucy, the dog, was not playing the piano at that point. She was just lifting her paw a little bit. And I was making progress. I mean, this is not going to happen in two seconds, right? Uh, and I didn't close the door all, all the way. And in the room walks that cat, Ricky. Ricky was not even a year old at that point. So in the room, he walks. 
looks at me, looks at the dog, looks at the piano, and begins to do that, begins to go ping, 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 ping on the piano. And I thought, well, what am I fooling around with this dog for? So I <laughs> pulled the dog out of the room and began to work with Ricky. And I didn't have to teach Ricky. I had a prodigy. And Ricky was happily going ping, ping, ping. I was kind of catching up with Ricky, like, how do I train a cat that's training me? Because Ricky was already playing the piano. So I didn't need the clicker, really, really, even though I was using it. I would give him treats to play longer, but that wasn't necessary. And the only way he'd stop is if I took the piano away. Ricky loved playing the piano. Don't know why. Clearly, there was some music in his past history. You'll have to tell me about how music and cat families, because you're the genetic expert. But, but it, it was clear that Ricky enjoyed doing this. The other thing that Ricky really liked to do was to be with us mm. very much. This was a Velcro cat. And if I went into a room, Ricky was not only in that room, but often on my shoulder, as you saw, or in my lap, was always with us or between me and my wife. Always, always. And when we left, we live in a condo on the near north side of Chicago. And when we left, we had a neighbor once even saying, did you leave a baby alone in your unit? Because Ricky was screaming. Because we left with, we had two dogs, actually. You saw both of them a couple of slides back. When we would leave, sometimes Ricky would actually scream. So cats can have separation anxiety. And this cat had separation anxiety to some extent and, and was very, and wanted to go with us in theory, but then where do you take a cat? Turns out we could. Oh, part of, <laughs> I'm getting a little excited, getting a little excited. That's okay. Part of the reason for this, and I don't know if she's here now in the audience, was the way that our breeder, Leslie Spiller, mm -hmm socialized Ricky even before we had Ricky. Another reason for this was Ricky's mom, Marilyn, I believe her name. Interestingly enough, my mother's name. Maybe not a coincidence. <laughs> very, very social as well. Um, the Devon Rex breed tends to be a social breed, but this was really social. And, and it turned out when we took Ricky out with us, Ricky had a great time. Next slide. All right. All right. So these are some places where we went. So at the above right, you see a famed cat behavior consultant and my colleague, Pam Johnson Bennett, who lives in Tennessee. She was visiting Chicago uh, to promote a book. Maybe hard to see on that slide, but this is at a Petco or PetSmart uh, store. And Ricky did recitals in these stores. We would make arrangements. We'll be there at three o'clock on Thursday. They'd promote it. Uh, they didn't charge anything. It was just another opportunity for Ricky to go outside. Very professional in what Ricky can do. Now, Chris, you're saying, well, what do you mean professional? I am talking professional because right behind you cannot see it, but our guinea pigs, hamsters, and gerbils. Ooh. Ricky was still playing the piano. <laughs> it was amazing. and. Because I work in the media, it was soon enough that Ricky became a TV star. Now, remember, this is about the year 2000, 1999, 1998 in there. Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, first of all, no YouTube, for sure. So I would literally contact people. And then once I did and once it began to happen, it just took off on its own. So jumping through hoops above, that is from... I think a, a show that was on PBS, but I know it was from a TV show at the bottom right where it says the, the piano teacher. Uh, that's actually something that Oprah did. Uh, and what she did is have a real piano. That lady's a real piano teacher. And she had a Southern draw and she'd knock on our door. And this was all pre-planned to some degree. She knocked on our door and she said, I'm here to give Ricky and the you know crew is here. The lights are here. Sound man, cameraman, Ricky loved it. You know, he loved the social. So all those people are here, all that commotion. Mm -hmm. Like that, actually. She knocked on the door, knock, knock, knock. I'm here to give Ricky the piano lesson. I let her in and the cameras follow her. She sits on a sofa 
and says, okay, here's the piano. I want you to practice, practice, and practice. And that's not our cat in the background. <laughs> and said, practice, practice, practice. And, and Ricky would then look at her, look at the piano, and when tinkle, tinkle, and then stopped. And they, they, and they kept it. They kept that take because here's what happened next. She's serious. This is how into it she is. She looks at Ricky the cat and says, I said, practice. Why are you stopping? And Ricky's just looking at her. And she said, you know, I worked three months ago on this show with Luther Vandross. And when I said to him, you practice again, you rehearse again, he did it. That's Luther Vandross. If Luke, and she's serious. <laughs> serious. And then Ricky listened. And I, I would be afraid of her too. And, and went ping, 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 ping again on the piano. Um, the bottom picture is uh, WGN radio. Uh, computers actually looked like that at one point, friends. And uh, Ricky jumped off one of those keyboards. You didn't have camera phones, you know, so I don't have as many pictures as I'd like. I wouldn't have had a picture of this. Jump from there onto the console, the radio console, and actually 50,000 watt station hit something and knocked us off off the air. Oh. And, and Steve King and Johnny Putman, the air personalities, actually remind me of that story to this day. These legendary, and they are legendary radio personalities, remember that story. I could go on and on with entertaining, amazing Ricky stories. I mean, he, it's, he is just an amazing, I mean, amazing celebrity cat in every sense of that term. And he got to be just that. Uh, so people actually, social media was starting at that time. And, and people at that time, and maybe some of you watching, I don't know if people can comment live, you know, oh. pardon me? I said they absolutely can keep on commenting. Hopefully oh, yeah. we have some people who remember here. Yeah, I haven't seen any of the, maybe I need to click live comments. There we go. <laughs> on the oh my gosh, all of you are commenting. Thank you. <laughs> I, I've not seen any of these. <laughs> wrong thing pushed. So I'll have to play catch up. But people knew who Ricky was. Go, go ahead to the next one here. Oh, yeah. So uh, my veterinarian at that time called me, uh, Dr. Donna Solomon in Chicago, where I live and said, I'm really mad at you, Steve. I said, why? Uh, you made an appointment for Ricky's physical exam, and it was just that, a checkup physical exam. Mm -hmm. But uh, you didn't say you were bringing the piano. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll bring the piano. So I brought the piano, and if there's extra time when we're done, remind me, I could tell what happened in the waiting room. Okay. I'll, I'll never forget. I'm, I just don't want to go over time. And we had the <laughs> exam. Ricky actually performed in the exam room first. So mm -hmm. you had everyone in the waiting room there with all their dogs and you had the entire staff, you know, veterinary exam rooms are barely large enough for a dog, the family bringing the dog, the veterinarian and the technician. Well, you had all these people crammed in there, but Ricky did his little improvisational jazz. And afterwards, every, everybody applauds. Thank you very much. Thank you. And she begins, as people file out of the room, she begins her exam. Mm -hmm. Take the stethoscope to the heart. There's a cookie jar there for a reason. That's what the story is about for later. Takes the stethoscope to the heart. And I saw the expression on her face. And, and sometimes being me is not easy in a lot of ways. Uh, but one is I know too much, you know. And when she, I saw that expression, I instantly kind of knew in my heart that something might be wrong. Yeah, yeah, and that that is such such a tough thing to hear and see, especially if you know veterinarians know their body, know your own veterinarian and their body language itself. Yeah, so we went to the veterinary cardiologist because, indeed, incidentally, she heard a murmur. You'll explain, I'm sure, Dr. Menges, what that, what that is all about and how significant that may or may not be, actually. Absolutely. Right? So we want to do the ultrasound, which is your gold standard, uh, even then. Uh, and Dr. Michael Luthi, who's a legend in veterinary cardiology. Uh, and on rare occasion, I still get to see him, one of the nicest people on the planet. Uh, had good news and bad news. The good news is, you can go on to the next slide, I think. The good news is uh, we know what this is. It's 
feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the bad news is it's going to run its course one way or the other, whatever it does. We can give you this medication. A tenanol was the name of the medication we use. You could talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is it wasn't going to do a whole lot. You know, it might slow the progression of the disease. We really don't know. Um, and today we really don't know. The good news is because of the Ricky Fund, we know more. So what Dr. Luthi also told me is that um, these things could possibly happen to your cat. Um, living out a normal life was one of the options. I uh, decided not to travel with Ricky at all. Uh, so we would go locally to places, but I even stopped doing that at some point. Uh, so there was no more piano playing on the road. A crew would have to come to our house mm. if we wanted to see it. And a lot of the crews had seen it. So it was mostly friends and relatives and neighbors at that point. Uh, but that's okay uh, because we he lived to live, love us and all of that. We would take him with us sometimes whenever we went because he seemed less stressed if he was with us than not. But um, one day Ricky was just eating his meal, which is was his favorite thing to do, I think. And very much like me. And... Uh, as he was eating, I, I remember the space. I'm not in that room now. Um, and he just fell over. And I think every neighbor within a mile heard me scream. And uh, that's when I began, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking. You know, so I rushed to the veterinarian. There was nothing, that's sudden death. And that's the number one cause of sudden death in cats is feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is what we're talking about. And uh, Ricky taught me everything that I know about what cats can be and gave me an opportunity to communicate so many of those messages to other people. And I thought this disease is so common, nothing can be done that is so wrong. So that is when I contacted the Wind Feline Foundation. And you can go back to the slides now, I think. And uh, that is when I began uh, the Ricky Fund. Uh, which has since funded several studies that are responsible for a lot of what we do know today about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats, including uh, some of the gene defects that occur in specifically in Maine Coon and Ragdoll cats. And, uh, and you are completely right about that. And when you say some of the, the gene defects, you functionally mean all of the gene defects that we, we learn about. We know. Yeah. Um, the Ricky Fund has been such a great, great push to help us learn more about how to prevent this disease. So in order to learn more, that's where the text to donate does come in at the bottom of the screen. So if you're so inclined, um, I'm here to tell Ricky's story. I'm happy to talk about Ricky anytime. Um, you know, all these years later, it's still sometimes hard for me to do that. Um, I don't know that I'll have another bond with another animal. Had I fallen into a well, he would have been my lassie. I'm certain of that. But moreover, it wasn't only me, it was others that benefited by Ricky. And we have a story, did you work out the audio? Uh, unfortunately, I did not, did not. We'll be able to pull the audio and post it with mm. it in the comments though. But so folks, we will have still some more audio for you to listen to at the end. So the audio is of Paul Harvey for those of you old enough to remember the radio legend, uh, the rest of the story, that guy, um, who told two stories about Ricky. I posted one here. And uh, if this story doesn't make you cry, then you don't have to donate. But the story will. And uh, it's, it's, you know, people talk about and appropriately what dogs can do and what dogs mean uh, to all of us, and you heard uh, you heard our dog. We had a dog who recently passed away. Um, that's all true, uh, but it's all true with cats as well. And, and I think people don't pay enough attention to that. Oh, you guys do who are here watching, you know that. But America, the world, if you've never had a cat, you may not know that. So uh, because of the difference the Ricky Fund has made, we want to continue to make that difference. The reality is, thank goodness, thank goodness for Base Paws and other private entities which are trying to help, uh, but can't do it alone. I don't think Dr. Menges is amazing, but he can't do it alone.
And, and, and we, we need help from all possible places in the reality dollars drive that help. So if, if you can move it in your heart to even give a couple of dollars, whatever you can, I know it's a very difficult time now. Uh, that would be very much appreciated, not by me, not by the one feline foundation, but by cats of tomorrow who, who may not need to suffer or may not need to die of HCM. I mean, that is, it's such a, I don't, I don't know how to, how to honestly follow that. Um, you know, it's such a hard story to hear and, and for you to tell as well. So, um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have so many people that have, have joined us as well, and I'm not the certainly the only one thanking you. Um, you know, Kathleen wanted to also thank you for sharing your story as, um, and, and all that you're doing from that as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I know who that is. I actually know who that is. Oh, well, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and, but there are so many others here, hundreds, thousands, I don't know, but I, I haven't been reading them as I've been talking, but as you talk, I'll, I'll try to read through. No, that's wrong, because I really should be paying attention to you and only you, so. Well, um, you know, as, as, as such a, a hard act to follow from that, you know, as, as Steve did mention, this is only a start. Um, as these, we've got a picture here of both the Maine Coon and the, and the Ragdoll breeds. Um, these were two of the breeds that we do have a lot of mutations or that we know about mutations that can affect these breeds as well. Uh, and so, that, I, <laughs> yeah, here's, here is the picture of Paul Harvey. Um, <laughs> he, unfortunately, I don't know if we can like say, if, if most, many people recognize the face, it may be more of a voice, a voice recognition from there. But, uh, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm, I am gonna take over a little bit right now and talk more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Cause you know, as Steve mentioned, as, as you mentioned that so many people don't know about this disease and I want y'all to have a base understanding and, and, or to answer any questions so that you can tell people if you do know cat owners that don't know about this, please tell them about it so that they understand risks or, or early signs to look for. Um, just to kind of start everything off in kind of this crazy world that we live in as well right now, it's always so important to understand where our information is coming from. Um, the internet is, is a very vast place and we can get lots of different information from lots of different places. But all of our information um, comes from the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Um, so what these are, this is a great college that board certifies a lot of the various specialties, including neurology, internal medicine, and cardiology. And one of the things that they do is they get some very, very extremely smart cardiologists like Dr. Joshua Stern from UC Davis or Mark Kittleston um, to come together and do a review of all of the literature that's out there about, about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM and put out a good, where are we now? What do we know and where do we go from here? Um, so that's where all of this comes from and that's called the consensus statement. Last one was released just a month ago um, so we are really on the cutting edge of what we know right now. And we've got the link right here to directly to that article as well as to their homepage. Um, so if you do have any need for a specialist, they'll tell you where all the cardiologists or anything come from as well. Um, I do, I always wanna give them, them credit. They make uh, veterinary, they make the veterinary industry smarter in every sense of the term and do such a good job taking care of all of our pets out there. Uh, now, HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when we move into this, we have to really start to think about what, what is this? We've talked about this. We know it's a heart disease and that it can cause sudden death. And now we do commonly abbreviate it as HCM, and you've heard Steve use that, you've heard me use that, uh, mostly because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a huge word and we don't really want to constantly have to say it over and over again. But we can break it down. We can break down what that word means so that we can learn a little bit more of, of how this disease looks. Um, first thing that we, we can break it down from their Latin roots is hyper. Hyper means bigger. Then trophic means growth. Then we've got cardio, which means heart. Myo means muscle. And pathy means disease. So if we combine all those together in that order, we've got a bigger growth heart muscle disease. It really just sounds like we were trying to create a complicated word to describe what you're doing, what's what's happened to the cats there from our, um, to the hearts. But this is such an, 
a better way to really start to understand what we're looking at. Now in words, it's just one thing, but when we start to look at pictures, we can really start to move this understanding a little bit more forward. Now, this is a cat heart. We've got a picture of a cat heart. Steve, does this, this is look, uh, do you recognize this on here? Sure. Of course. Now, I will say with some folks, we do have the heart. It is positioned lengthwise um, as opposed to, or kind of horizontally, as opposed to vertically like we normally see the human heart. Uh, part of the reason for this is because this is a lot of the ways that we see the heart when we do an echocardiogram. Um, this is one of the common views and of the different chambers themselves. So we've got lots of little identification letters over here, but the ones that we really wanna focus on are right over here, this LV, this stands for left ventricle. So the heart is used, uh, pumps blood throughout the body. The way that normally works is the blood comes in to the right atrium, this RA, over to the right ventricle, goes out to the lungs and gets some nice good oxygen that it can, to help the body live and start to continue to spread energy to those cells. Comes back in this left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then pushes back out the aorta. Now that aorta then leads to the heart. So that blood takes, the, or the heart takes that fully oxygenated blood and pushes it all the way around the heart, so around the body, so that there can be some nice, good oxygen. Where this changes comes on our, on the right side. So the right side we see here, we see the, uh, left ventricle in this word hypertrophy. We just remember hyper is big or bigger and trophy is growth. Now this IVS is the septum, it's the wall that separates the right and the left ventricle. And in HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this wall starts to grow. And this growth really changes how, how this how the blood flow through the heart really works. Now it can change it in a couple different ways and it may not affect it that much at all. But in this scenario, it's affected it pretty drastically. We have this dynamic obstruction. LVOT means left ventricular outflow tract. And the best way to think about this is the same way as if you're, you're watering your garden. You've got a hose, there's no end on the hose, and we'll think of that as the, the normal aorta. The water is just pouring out easily. But if you take your thumb and you start to close it across there, it starts to take that water and, and it, you can feel that pressure back up behind and kind of slow down as the water starts to squeeze out a little harder from there. Um, this, this, this kind of back pressure really starts to dilate this left atrium that we see. Um, and that's where we have a lot of blood that's st kind of starting to slow down, pool a little bit in ways that it normally should. Um, I, and like I say, I think this is such a great way to see it. Have you ever seen this uh, example or diagram like this, Steve? Yes, actually, because I've had the honor of watching Steve Ettinger mm. uh, describe everything is an honor watching. So uh, Dr. Ettinger is the father of veterinary medicine, right? And, um, and on right on my bookshelf right behind me. Yeah, everybody does. And uh, I'm honored to call him a friend. And, and I've seen him present many times. And, you know, he, he's, he's done that. So I'm lucky I have. Well, I hope, I hope I've lived up a little bit to his presentation. <laughs> they, were, they are amazing, are amazing. Um, but yes, yeah, so this, this kind of lets us get a little bit of a visual picture. We start to see where that blood can slow down, how things are actually structurally changing in the heart itself. And so we really, oh, we got a, we got a hanging, hanging little bullet right there. But when we start to think about how common is it, we, we've used these terms a lot. We said it's the number one cause of sudden death, right? Um, but where does this, how much does this actually affect the population? Uh, we'll use the word prevalence. You may have heard this word a lot, actually, in the last six months. Um, and it's usually an epidemiologic term and has been a little bit more popular with um, COVID um, news reporting as well. But the prevalence definition means how much of the population actually has the disease? How widespread is this? And so in cats with HCM, it's estimated that with all ages taken into account, 15% of cats have this. Now in, in, you have HCM. Now in a shelter scenario, we typically have, you know, in a, in a medium sized shelter scenario, you can have 30, 40, 50 cats um, at a time. And then even then the, the population being adopted out, you can easily have multiple cats in a shelter at once already having HCM while they look perfectly healthy. 
Now, as we get older, that estimated can go up to 29%, usually about seven to eight years and older on there. It means about three out of 10 cats uh, come in with, a, with HCM of some sort. We may not be able to fully see it, but it is there. And then these numbers continue to rise as we move into the Maine Coons and the Ragdolls, um, breeds that were predisposed to this. They have some higher ratios, so even Maine Coons, it was estimated at one point up to 42%. Um, but there's been a lot of great work to help bring that number down genetically. That was fueled by the Ricky Fund, by the discoveries of the Ricky Fund from there. Uh, you know, there is so much, I know I'm, I'm rolling through so much we have, but I'm so excited to, to have y'all's attention and help you learn about this more. Now we do have what's called the phenotype. We, we think about HCM, we think about the changes that we just talked about. And these changes aren't exclusive to genetic diseases. Um, that's one really important thing that we, we learn to know and, and does complicate a little bit about how we learn and how we research HCM. Um, but there are two really main ones that we think about also contributing to these same types of signs and symptoms. Um, the first one is, is chronic hypertension. Now, we think of in humans as hypertension as stress, stress with your job, stress um, at family, stress at home. And while at cats, uh, at, Steve, what do you think about cats being stressed? Um, are they are they prone to stress at all, in your opinion? Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> An understatement. Uh, so, but what we don't know is if there is any link between that anxiety and stress, uh, right. which many cats do have, uh, mm -hmm. even though their people may not realize it and love their cats every bit, um, and and heart disease. What we do know is that that anxiety and stress is related to other medical problems, mm -hmm. potentially. Potentially, we see a lot of anxiety and stress or hear a lot of anxiety and stress being associated with urinary problems like litter box issues or inappropriate eliminations there. And it's so interesting when we start to think about these, we have to make sure that we separate our mind from how we think it affects humans to also how we know it affects, how we think it affects cats. So. The hypertension itself, a lot of just kind of chronic blood pressure, um, exactly why those changes. A lot of times our older cats have what's known as idiopathic. And that is a really fancy way to say unknown, um, of unknown origin. And so idiopathic hypertension is a common one. Um, and then hyperthyroidism as well, another increasing disease that we're starting to see in our cats. Um, these, both of these will start to cause the same sort of structural changes in the heart itself. And then another, the lastly, kind of the very big one that we're talking about here today and what we want to learn so much about here at BasePause and through the Ricky Fund um, is genetic reasonings. Uh, the reason we can have genetic on this list is because of, of the Ricky Fund. It used to be that Maine Coons and Ragdolls had idiopathic causes for their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but now we can now put these under genetic. We can understand and look and test and learn how to prevent and that's really how we learn to differentiate. Um, it's through testing itself. Uh, we mentioned before the echocardiogram that Ricky got that was gold standard back at that time and is still gold standard today. This echocardiogram is like an ultrasound. It's an ultrasound, but we normally think of it for, uh, for pregnancies or abdominal uh, issues. But when we use it to look at the heart, it's called an echocardiogram itself. The best place to get those done through is through a board certified veterinary cardiologist. Um, they'll be able to help measure the heart wall, the thickness, and if there's any obstruction or change in the flow itself. We had a question a little earlier about ejection fraction. Um, and I, I believe, let's see, this is from Angie on here. What, what is the ejection fracture to be considered HCM found in the echocardiogram? And the ejection fraction, we actually start to, the, or rather the cardiologists, uh, for a specific diagnosis, we'll actually look more at the wall thickness and changes in that or the dilation of the atrium itself, uh, more at the structural changes than the specific flow patterns for this disease. Um, now we have another question that I did not quite answer yet, but of course wanted to come to, and that's from, from Kathleen uh, um, Niles, uh, your friend right here, Steve. Uh, are there symptoms to watch for that may suggest your cat has HCM? Now there's a variety of ones that, that we watch for. The, many of them are actually gonna be harder to detect. And so we'll talk about the ones that you can see are the most common ones that are seen at home. Uh, first off, such as in Ricky's case, 
many of these remain subclinical. These are the areas where we have no visible signs, no visible symptoms. Um, cat is acting normally, eating normally, running normally, playing normally, uh, but still potentially has some structural changes to the heart. Uh, these can, in these cases, they may still be able to be diagnosed or at least staged with x-rays or, or, or an echocardiogram, but it's, it still is a may. It may be very, very mild changes itself. When we start to look at the symptoms of what HCL starts to cause, uh, this is where we start to see the ones that we, we look at at home or can see the ones that we can see at home, Kathleen. So in congestive heart failure, this is where the heart has, the structure has changed. And at this point in time, the blood really isn't flowing as fast enough to keep up with normal function. And that means that there's a little bit of slowing down the blood. It's backed up towards the lungs which causes extra little bit of fluid on the lungs to form, called pleural effusion on there. Um, or sorry, uh, pulmonary effusion on there. I'm getting, getting my P's confused real quick. Um, now this causes lethargy. Lethargy is weakness or tiredness. Uh, a lot of times in veterinary clinics, we see cats that come in with lethargy um, or difficulty breathing, cats that seem to be breathing harder than normal. They're not exercising, they're not playing like normal. And this is an extremely common reason that we start to be able to see a cat and then move into the diagnostics. Normally with that cat, we would take an x-ray first, see if there's anything wrong. And then if there, if there is something that we see structurally wrong, like the heart is bigger, but we don't know why, we don't know which side of the heart is bigger potentially, we can refer you to that board certified cardiologist to further get down in there. Um, and the last thing which we don't see that is as common, but does happen is fainting. Uh, fainting is possible with, with congestive heart failure as it gets a little longer on. The scary one, uh, which contributes to the sudden death as well, is the arterial thrombolisms, um, also called ATE. Now, a thromboembolism is known as a clot. Uh, the way that these clots form is that in that diagram we talked about, that right atrium where the blood has slowed down, it's kind of pooled down, that has been able to slow down enough for the clot to be able to form it. At some point, that clot does break free, but doesn't break down, and then gets ejected out of the heart through the aorta to a point in the body. It tries to travel through all of the various blood vessels until it hits the blood vessels start big, and then they get smaller, 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 and it travels until it hits one of those branches that's just too small for it to go through and gets stuck and then blocks the blood growing, going into that entire blood vessel. This can be, this is extremely painful. And um, we have so many comments um, on our Facebook page about people who have experienced, uh, who've had a cat that experienced ATE. And it's such a uh, emotionally distressing time for both the cat and the owner. Here, the, the cat will, will be in extreme pain um, and be, uh, extremely loud about it and it may not be able to feel its back legs or um, one leg or its entire back end itself. The, uh, these limbs are cold because there's no blood cooling to it and they, these cats are suddenly paralyzed from there. Um, so when these cats, if you do have a cat that experiences these symptoms, please take them to emergency room or veterinary as soon as possible to make sure that this is all to try and, and get these through. Unfortunately, many of the cats that have ATEs are euthanized, but there is treatments that we can help them um, get through this initial acute process, uh, though managing the chronic, as we'll talk about, as we've mentioned, is a little bit more difficult. Um, so yeah, Kathleen, for your question, are there symptoms to watch for that may suggest your cat has HCM? The main ones we're going to be looking for are lethargy and difficulty breathing on there as well. Um, if you do, Steve, if you see any comments, of course, feel free to, to stop me, pull them out, questions, and, and I'll be happy to, we'll be happy to answer them as, as we keep rolling through on here. Sure. You know, so one symptom, of course, is sudden death. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned about the prevalence of HCM and how significant that is. I would argue that it's even more, it's more prevalent than we thought because those indoor, outdoor cats that never come back we don't know why they don't come back. And one of the reasons they don't come back, of course, is that they may have been chased by an animal, mm -hmm. by a car, but they may have died suddenly because of HCM. Also, there is no CDC for pets. So we don't know exactly how many cats die suddenly. 
uh, and not everyone does a necropsy and animal autopsy. So it's, it's likely uh, significantly more prevalent even than what you mentioned. Well, and you know, one of the things that does have kind of confusing things as well, and I think I agree with your point entirely, is as our cats get older and as we start to have other diseases like um, uh, Presley mentioned that she also had a cat with, with kidney disease as well, we start to try and think about all these different possible diseases that may be affecting the cat. And then when the cat does pass away, we don't know exactly which one was that was that largest contributor. And I think that HCM may slide under a lot of these diseases. We, we may get focused on what we see with the litter box or with, uh, with the teeth or with the ears or eyes, but it can kind of be that silent, silent push that we just don't know quite exactly what's happening on there. And it's not only so to answer Paula, Paula, by the way, is a big deal with the Cat Writers Association. To answer uh, Paula's question, uh, it's not only, and, and you can talk about this uh, a bit, Dr. Menges, it's not only the breed she mentions, which are ragdolls and Maine Coons that we spoke about, but we do know it runs in other breeds as well, including, let's see if I can name them all. We'll see, you'll test me. Uh, <laughs> Devon Rex, clearly, mm -hmm. that's the cat that I had. A Sphinx cat, and someone here mentioned that I had a Sphinx cat as well. Yes, Amanda mentioned this as well right here. How did you get that up there so fast? You're amazing. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Persians, mm -hmm. exotic, um, British short hair. Um, what am I missing? I think I'm missing some. But, Beng pardon me? Bengals? Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately. So, so we do know that in those breeds, we know. But, but what hasn't happened, because we don't have enough money to do it, and researchers who are able to do it, uh, we, we don't know what the genetic defects are exactly. And even in the breeds that we do know, we know those are gene defects, but it doesn't mean there aren't other gene defects. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, there are, we've talked about the two that we know right now. We mentioned the Maine Coon and the Ragdolls. And in humans, we have a similar, a very similar genetic issue uh, that can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in humans as well. But in humans, there's over 1,500 that have been identified at this point in time. Uh, 1,500 mutations or markers that can, can cause it. And we are, we're currently at two. And so that's why we are so passionate about trying to raise that number so that we can help understand more and help give some, some more preventative or, or information so that owners can look, even if there aren't signs or symptoms, they are know when to look for it as well. Uh, now we do, oh my goodness, the, we do have this, you, you beat me to it, you beat me to my cop, to the common breeds on there, but our common risk factors that we see in these cats are, are older and male with heart murmurs. This, these aren't the only cats that we see that can have it, but they are ones, they are the most commonly, commonly diagnosed with HCM as well. Um, the majority, though, of cats that do have HCM do not have pedigrees. So even though we know that it runs in the Maine Coons, Ragdolls, Persians, Bengals, Sphinxes, Exotic, short hair, British short hairs, um, Norwegian for forest cats, um, oh my goodness, uh, on and on, it, it is a problem for cats everywhere. Uh, and that's so, in many ways, rare for a, a, a specific genetic disease. Now, when we start to think about this disease, I, I wanna kind of walk you through a little bit about how we stage it. What do we think when we, when we see a cat that comes in and gets an echocardiogram? Um, and so when we look at the disease staging, we would call these things A, we typically call them A, B, C, D, but with feline HCM, we've had to sort it out a little bit more uh, specific for that. Now in A, we have our predisposed column, and this is where we, uh, and Steve looks like Leslie was able to make it on as well. Yes, uh, <laughs> he's correct in pointing out American short hairs are another breed. And what I've learned over the years is Leslie is usually correct anyway, and she is about that. And, and really, I'm so grateful what, for what breeders like her, who care so much, have done over the many years for whatever their respective breed is to do the best they can to mm -hmm. try to kind of, all right, we'll, we want to make sure that this doesn't occur again in a litter. And, uh, you know, I want to make clear, it's nobody's fault that this happens. And and now, at least in the two breeds we keep talking about, ragdolls and Maine Coons, breeders at least have the opportunity 
And mm-hmm. they're taking advantage of that responsible breeders to do something anyway, it's not a perfect solution, to minimize the amount of HCM we're seeing. We don't have tests for these other breeds and it's uh, it's a shot in the dark, you know, if, okay, if I'm producing a litter that has HCM, do I not breed that cat again? We really don't know the answers, which you can bet far better answer than me, but we really don't know the answers to all that. And, and certainly when you adopt a cat from a shelter, you have no way to know what that family history is, of course. Great grandpa cat that you're adopting from the shelter, did that cat have HCM? How would you know, you know? So, so we can today only do so much with genetics. The goal is to do more, which is what BasePause is working on and what we are trying to do to fund those studies. I interrupted you, I won't do that again, I'm sorry. No, I interrupted myself. I interrupted myself and gave you there. But yeah, so we are, these are like, say, are the stages. What base pause is looking to find and what we can find with these genetic diseases are these predisposed um, on the left side of the screen, this column A. And so that we know this cat has a, has a risk, is more at risk for HCM. That's what we want to be able to know and find out. Because the earlier that you can catch a heart disease, even, even with one like HCM, while we're still trying to slow things down, we don't have a cure for it. Um, the earlier we find it, the more, the better we can manage this and, and improve the quality of life as as it does progress. Um, now in B and B2, this is where we start to have cats that have a little bit more changes in their heart, but don't actually have any of the signs or symptoms yet. And then the last one is that the, or the C is when we are, have current or previous, you've had some sort of signs and symptoms, some congestive heart failure or potential um of a clot event like an arterial thrombal embolism. And then D is where this heart failure is no longer responding to medications itself. Um, you mentioned that Ricky was was given a tenolol, and that is one of the drugs that is is used to help there. It's um, It was mentioned and brought out by, uh, oh my goodness, it's back up here about, about it being a beta blocker. Um, and this is usually in humans was used to treat hypertension, but it can also be used for those cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, Angie specifically asked this really good in-depth question about how to be able to treat structurally abnormal hearts such as HCM. And depending on the type of drug depends on its interaction with the heart itself. So um, certain drugs like a common one that's used is uh, called pimobindan may not be appropriate if certain structural changes have presented. So that's why it's super important to have veterinarian or board certified uh, veterinary cardiologist helping to manage these drugs uh, as as they're doing it specifically for the structure of your cat's heart itself. And, and your colleague there asked about pro-BNP, I think. Yes. Uh, yes. So can you comment on what that is and, and to the best of your ability, because we're not talking about an individual cat, but broadly speaking, how that can help. Yes, and so Kristen asked, um, so can, can I comment on the pro-BNP test itself? And so the pro BNP test is a, a test to test for a, a certain peptide that can be created when basically the heart muscle is undergoing stress of, of some level. So the higher it is, basically the, the more of a chance that this may be related to, uh, to a heart disease or a heart murmur. With many of these cats, we don't actually see any heart murmurs um, as well. They can have a heart murmur. We mentioned that the most one of the most common factors is a heart murmur, but an underlying heart, they can have underlying heart disease and no murmur itself. Um, so that's partly why the pro BMP test was, was thought about and it can be used in conjunction with some of the other tests to get a good idea of if the heart is under some undergoing some sort of stress or pathological process. Uh, now, unfortunately, there still is just the same as when Ricky was diagnosed so long ago, um, there still is not, there's no cure yet at this point in time. So prevention is the best medicine. That is ideally the best medicine. We do that through early diagnosis. Um, they try and prevent some of these signs and symptoms as they happen, or before they happen rather. And then also through breeding practices, the good breeding practices that you mentioned, Steve, um, to try and prevent this found, if it's running in families, um, prevent it from passing on, or if you have the ability to do a genetic test using genetic testing to make sure that you stop, we stop the known markers from continuing, known mutations from continuing on within the genetics themselves. Um, but I will say prevention is very difficult. I mean, most people do get uh, their cats from shelter, first of all, and thank you, thank you if you're doing that. Uh, or, or actually the second most common way people get cats, the cats get them. 
So you, you go out to get your newspaper in the morning and there's a cat. And, and you decide in the goodness of your heart to take that cat in to add to your collection of two or three that you already have. I mean, that is the second most common way we get our cats. And for those cats or the cat at the shelter that you get, there's no way, of course, uh, to know what that family history is. And, and prevention is really difficult if the, the signs of the disease are so subtle. Mm -hmm. And the treatment is so not very good. I mean, it can help. Uh, it could help delay onset of some of what you talked about, the thromboembolism, maybe sudden death or heart failure, which is none of those three things are, of course, things we want to see. Um, but it's not going to cure anything. Uh, a lot of cats, which you didn't talk about, and you probably should, because we need some good news. Uh, a lot of cats, I don't honestly know the percent, uh, different studies suggest different percentages, but it can be more than half of the cats with HCM or about half actually live out a very normal life. And mm -hmm. ultimately, you don't know even anything's wrong, which incidentally leads also to say, here again, they are underdiagnosed. No one knows there's anything wrong. Uh, and they die of kidney disease or a kind of cancer or something else. Absolutely. And a lot of these cats, like you mentioned, are in this kind of B1 sort of subclinical area. Um, now, we don't know they're there. Um, we haven't officially diagnosed them, but many have this area and just kind of stay in this area for their entire lives. Um, unfortunately, as you mentioned, the, the studies vary wildly because the amount of echocardiograms that we do on cats that don't have apparent heart disease is, in my opinion, it's it's too low. We just simply don't have an idea of, of what all has been going on. Like you mentioned, we don't have a, a cat CDC mode yet. And the other thing is cats, uh, so I'd argue uh, heart disease, different kinds of heart diseases, by the way, which commonly occur in dogs, um, we're, we're more aware of. First of all, we're more aware and dogs are more likely to tell us that they're not feeling well. But, but secondly, cats generally don't run around the house, mm -hmm. you know, and if they exercise less, especially as they age, uh, we just assume it's a cat. It's getting older. Uh, and, and the cat doesn't give an opportunity to present, I'm not feeling well illness, I'm not acting normal because I'm not chasing the toy. And we don't think about that twice because it is a cat, if you follow what I mean. Yeah, there's so many people that we have an idea that cats may be aloof or, or may be indifferent all of a sudden. They may have kind of a sudden change in personality and, and can attribute that since cats are so much more bursty in their exercise. We kind of want them to do five to 10 minutes of very excited play as opposed to the longer endurance play that we usually do or recommend with our dogs. I um, mean, so that, that can be very difficult to show. You know, um, we do have a question here from Jessica Wright that I think this is a really appropriate slide for us to look at it on here is, you know, she, she asks about her 11 year old male long hair tuxedo, um, recently diagnosed, has had yearly, two yearly echocardiograms. He does have a murmur, but is not on any medication. Does that sound like a normal treatment plan? Should we be doing more? And, you know, when we start to think about what a treatment plan looks like for each of these different stages, if um, your cat is still in this B1 stage um, and that's what the echocardiograms are for, then there's usually no medication given at this stage. There's no reason to do it um, because there are so many cats that live out their, their days without the need of medication. This isn't where that, that medication starts. Um, people start to think about doing medication once you get into the B2 stage. And most of that's just starting to try and prevent more of the clots to, to avoid having that very extremely painful and, and, and traumatizing ATE or, or potential sudden death scenario that, that goes on from there. Um, so once you get into B2 and higher, then that's when medication is, is usually thought to uh, recommended by the ACVA. Uh, oh my goodness. Well, we've, I know we've been talking about so much, so much. So, uh, we've got another hanging bullet on here. We have, how do we learn about genetic prevention though? So that, that really kind of brings us to why we're here, why we're here. Uh, Wayne asked a really pertinent question. It last, lines up straight with this. Um, Wayne asked, do you do genetic testing on non-pedigree cats? Um, and we certainly do. Our cat kit, our base paws cat kit, which is found at www.basepaws.com, um, is 
aimed at finding at the breed relativities for cats that are non-pedigreed, so the ones that come from the shelter, the ones that, that adopt us, uh, can be found to, to learn a little bit more, just how, how do they get where they are? Um, or what are they more closely related to? Are there any risks that we need to think about? So of course, this is, this is our website. You probably know it. Um, you are on our Facebook page or on our YouTube. Um, so that is, is the easiest place to find it from there. Uh, but then we, we use that information. Um, we test for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy along with a variety of other genetic diseases as well. Um, now, Steve, like you mentioned, these two mutations are not the only mutations that we have. And so folks, if you do have a cat that you did test with base paws or did have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and tested negative for the known markers, please, please, please let us know. There are so many out there and that's so many out there that can affect what our, our we consider our non-pedigreed or our, our rescue or our, our self-adopting cats that we want to be able to offer those the, the ability to learn more and, and help learn about uh, prevention or, or early signs or risks to watch out for. Now, one of the things that we do also have, and a lot of this funding mentioned to the Ricky Fund, Ricky Fund does a great job besides running these two as well. Um, there's also other studies that are out there, some from NC State. I'm, I think you may be involved in some of those as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we do not want to to not mention those some. We're not the NC State is currently running trials for for three breeds: um, the Sphinx, the Persian, and the Bengal. Um, so if you do have a pedigree uh, pedigree Persian, Bengal, or Sphinx that does has HCM, please let them know. Um, apply on their site, and they'll uh, to help them learn more about that disease as well. Um, even if you don't have one, if you if you have a cat that does not have HCM, uh, please contact them anyways. This is such a great, uh, with any of the research we do, we have to have cats that are affected by the disease and cats that aren't. Um, and that I think is something that gets overlooked a little bit. So if you do have one of those breeds, it is pedigreed, it does have um, papers from Tika, CFA, please contact NC State in the, to help them with those as well. And, and you are similarly, I believe, looking for cats that have been diagnosed with HCM. Yes, we are. We are constantly looking for cats that have been diagnosed with HCM. Ours don't have to be pedigree. Um, so if you do have a cat that does have HCM, uh, you can go to our website at www.basepaws.com slash research. And that is where you can apply for um, a variety, not just HCM, but a variety of other diseases as well. Um, these uh, if you do qualify, there's going to be certain criteria we walk you through. Um, if you do qualify, it will be uh, we'll see, ship you a free kit and give you a free breed report and free health marker report um, as we as we learn more about the genetics themselves and use those to help advance and push uh, the uh, genetic knowledge we have about cats. Oh my goodness, we have we we're just keeping on. We're going over. I am so sorry. There's something though that I have to bring up, and this is. The very specific, we talked about it beforehand, the Ricky Fund. Um, we've had the, the banner at the bottom, text cats to donate to HCM studies. But if you also want to donate directly to the Ricky Fund on the computer as well, you can go uh, to this website and look under special programs as well um, to really help uh, give directly to the Ricky Fund and continue to support uh, this, this fund. That has, Steve, I just it's been so crucial to what we know today. And I can't, I can't thank you enough for doing it. I'm honored to be on their board. I've been on their board for maybe 15 years or so. And uh, it's, it's one of the greatest things that I've been lucky enough to be involved in. Uh, oh. I, I'm able to see, you know, now we have, this is another hour talk in of itself, but now we have a solution to FIP, feline infectious peritonitis. And it's the same solution, essentially, at least what we have so far, for COVID-19, which is called remdesivir. Uh, huh? So it's true. Different conversation, but it's an honor to be involved with such an organization, winfelinefoundation.org, or text to donate, and the number is right there on your screen. Well, um, folks, we have, let's see, we've got a couple more questions. I think we've been able to, to answer some of these as they've come through and, and really being from there. Um, Laura, the Laura had a very big question. It covers all of us. I'm going to take away our screen right now, but it covers all of us on there. You talked about 
um, looking into NC State. Um, the link itself is very, very long, unfortunately. We'll post it afterwards um, just to, to help you see it from there. Uh, but if you do have one of those three specific breeds, they would be, um, Dr. Mears would be extremely excited to be able to hear and, and add those in there. Um, but, oh, you know, Steve, there has been so much that we've covered uh, with all of this. And I, I really, I want to give you an, an opportunity to, I, Try to ask some questions. We, we, of course, told the story, but is there any way, anything else that you want to give you the floor to, to end this on uh, from there? Am I out of time, pretty much? We're, we're well, done? Well, we're not out of time. We're not out of time. We've got some folks, but we, we've kind of gone through here, and I think we've had some really great, great uh, uh, contact. You know, Paul, of course, is also looking for the NC State for information, but I think we've we've done a great job from there, and I, I want to I want to give people a great a great ending note and you you are always the best man for that <laughs> so so one day we go to the bank and we bring ricky the cat with us and ricky on my shoulder i walk into the bank as if there's nothing i don't know if i was making a deposit or withdrawing or what i was doing at the bank it was too long ago i don't remember but i walk in the security guard kind of looks at me you know like hmm walk in do my business teller gives me the money or takes away money i don't know walk out and on my way out security guard stops me. And I thought, uh oh, busted. I'm in trouble. Because, you know, you're not really supposed to bring a cat into a booth. And especially back then, I mean, this was 20 years ago. So I thought, I'm in trouble. Security guard says, very seriously, is that from that Spielberg movie? And I thought, what? He said, that on your shoulder. He didn't know it was real. <gasps> what? On my shoulder. And he said, it's animated, that toy. Because Ricky might have moved a little. I said, okay. He said, I want one of those. Does it speak? And just on cue, I swear, Ricky went, Row! and I just walked. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, well, that is, <laughs> that's amazing. You don't do uh, that every day. So I, I hope that you take it to heart, so to speak. Uh, you're clearly all cat lovers. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. The Wynn Foundation is here to make a difference. Uh, specifically, I'm about the Wynn Feline Foundation, but today, about the Ricky Fund, we want to make a difference. We cannot do that without dollars. Base Paws is doing that. Base Paws, thank you for helping us. Uh, we more than appreciate it. I thank Julie Legred, our executive director, for making this happen. I thank Kristen on your end. And all of your people, he has people. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Base Paws. You've been great to work with. Most importantly, all of you for joining us today. And I'm sorry we can't go another three hours, but probably uh, Dr. Menges has other things to do. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not entertaining for three hours, three hours. I'm, it's going to be, you're going to have to leave that up to you. Well, you know, again, and I'm going to be very thank, thankful for you and Julie for, for setting this all up. Wind Feline Foundation does so much besides HCM. If you do not know about the Wind Feline Foundation, go to the windfelinefoundation.org. There are so many great initiatives. They are such a unique cat focused organization um, that pushes, pushes the boundaries on on what we know about cats and cat health as well. Uh, we'd like to also give all of our, our deepest condolences. We've had so many people talk about um, experiences of cats with HCM um, and and all of those experiences. Uh, we know how the cats have, have really touched their lives and, and changed those as well. So uh, we do have, would like to give you all of our deepest condolences and please, 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 everyone stay safe out there, but have a great day. Thank you.